Global problems need global solutions. How about global government? Folks, we're facing an orchestrated invasion of the United States and the Western world more broadly. We've got an orchestrated civil war apparently brewing in the United States, and we've got an economic collapse being engineered to throw jet fuel on the dumpster fire of it all. Brought to you by the deep state, of course. Stay tuned and I'll tell you more. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant. Today, Jan spends the hour with our April 11 Understanding the Times one-night conference speaker, Alex Newman. The actions of the global government crowd are leaping right out of the Bible. You would think they are reading from Revelation 13. We'll talk about it and how we can push back the darkness. Here is today's uninterrupted programming. They actually have a UN of religions. It's called Religions for Peace. Okay. What a cute name. How could you be against Religions for Peace, right? Uh, well, it's funded by George Soros, by the Rockefellers, by the Ford Foundation, by the United Abominations, a bunch of UN agencies, the U.S. State Department, a bunch of New Age occultist foundations like the Fetzer Institute and others. And uh, here's their new executive director. Her name is Dr. Aza Karam. And uh, before taking over this entity, she was actually at the UN Population Fund. That's the UN agency dedicated to reducing the number of us people on this planet. They think there's too many of us, and they especially don't like the Africans. How dare those African women have four children? Who do they think they are? So here she is bragging about what this Religions for Peace actually is. My name is Azza Karam, and I have the privilege and the responsibility of serving a worldwide movement of interreligious institutions, organizations called Religions for Peace. In case you do not know it, we think of it as the United Nations of Religions. The United Nations has member states or governments. Religions for Peace has member religious institutions, all religious institutions. All representing religious all institutions. Religions representatives from all faith traditions where there are no institutions, as well as interfaith. Anyways, all religious institutions are members of this UN of religions. What happens if your religious institution is not a member? Well, you're not a legitimate religion. You're some cult. We need to shut you down. You're probably one of those extremist, Christian, nationalist, bigoted, you know, pick your nasty terms. You're not legitimate if you're not part of the UN of religions. I mean, come on, right? So they got together in 2019, all these religious leaders, all these pagans, they flew in with the feathered headdresses, they flew them in from the Amazon rainforest and everywhere else, and they signed a declaration. They agreed that all of them are going to urge their religious communities to align themselves with the Sustainable Development Goals. They actually committed to human development as set forth in the Sustainable Development Goals, which is basically global tyranny, global diabolical government. And welcome to Understanding the Times Radio. Say, we have a one-night Understanding the Times event coming up Thursday, April the 11th, here in suburban Minneapolis with our very special guest. You've just heard there the voice of Alex Newman. He's going to join me for the hour today, along with co-host of the event, Pastor Mark Henry. And let me just say this, the New World Order crowd, they're very busy. They are busy stirring up varying crises. They call it poly crises. At least that's what the World Economic Forum calls them. And don't we have a broad menu to choose from when it comes to poly crises? Goodness, war, famine, terror attacks, economic woes, immigration disasters, and instability everywhere. Let's throw in the indoctrination of our kids into the mix as well. And what about the climate agenda? And don't you know the world is facing an existential climate threat that could take the world down in a few years, and many suggest that this alone is the immediate item of concern for the whole world. So, climate, earth worship, making up a whole new religion today. How does this tie to the coming one world religion predicted in the Bible? And what is its tie to global government? Well, the one worlder crowd, as I said, it's very busy trying to create their glorious global system, which will turn out to be the seven-year tribulation known in the Bible as the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. Alex Newman is an award-winning international journalist, educator, author, speaker, and consultant. And in addition to serving as president of Liberty Sentinel Media, 
He has written for a wide variety of publications. He currently serves as a contributor to the Epoch Times, a correspondent for the Law Enforcement Intelligence Brief, foreign correspondent and senior editor for the New American Magazine, writer for WorldNet Daily. I could go on and on. And you've seen him on many media outlets, including Fox News, Newsmax, One American News. We carry his book, Deep State, The Invisible Government Behind the Scenes, that's in my online store. And we're going to talk about another one of his books in this hour as well. Pastor Mark Henry is a lead pastor at Revived Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and 412 Church in San Jacinto, California. He is my co-host at our frequent Understanding the Times one-day conference here in the Twin Cities. Mark is an author. He's featured on his channel, Christian TV, a conference speaker. Gentlemen, welcome both to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Jan. It's wonderful to be here. Great to be with you, Jan. Say, Alex, I am starting our discussion based on a message. Frankly, I heard both your messages at the rather recent Prophecy Watchers in Orlando, and I'm taking some comments and some questions and obviously some clips from a couple of those events. So help me understand here, because we're talking here for a few minutes, and the new climate agenda, and you stated in this message, you stated, it's a shocker, climate action replaces the Great Commission. You suggested sin is tied to carbon emissions, and in the new Ten Commandments, we must feel the pain of the earth. That's what they're telling us anyway. How did this all come about? Thank you, Jan. And I've been following the climate agenda my entire career in journalism. I've been doing this about 15 years now, and I've been going to these UN climate summits for about 15 years. Before I was even born, the same people, the same organizations were promoting very similar agendas, just under various different pretexts. So before climate was even an issue, they were telling us we were going to run out of resources, there wasn't going to be enough oil, there wouldn't be enough metals, and we'd have to reduce the population, we'd have to give up our freedoms, we'd have to drastically reduce the standard of living. All of the same solutions, right? Give us more money, give us more power, you get less money, you get less freedom, and we'll save you from resource depletion. Well, the resource depletion narrative really fell apart very rapidly. We've got more proven oil reserves that are accessible today than back when they started making these goofy predictions. So in the early 1990s is when they really, really shifted gears on the climate front. Back in the 70s and even into the 80s, they had started pushing the global cooling narrative. In fact, the Earth did cool a little bit from the 40s up through about the late 70s into the 80s. And so they told us that human emissions of CO2 were causing global cooling. There was going to be another ice stage. Again, same solutions, less oil, less freedom, less money for you, more control at the international level. In 1991, the Club of Rome got together and the Cold War was ending. They kind of needed a new justification for this huge government, these immense taxes, all these international agencies. And they came up with the idea, as they said in their report, the first global revolution, that climate change and global warming would be a good pretext because that way, in their words, humanity itself is the enemy. So they came up with that idea and really started pushing it. The agenda has been around for a long time. Climate change is just the latest pretext. But the religious angle is something that only more recently has truly come out of the closet. Even back in the 90s, you had some of the Rockefellers, some of these other guys. Back in the early 1990s, they had this blasphemous Ark of Hope. It was supposed to be kind of like the Ark of the Covenant, but people were really disgusted by that. So they kind of put it on the shelf for a time. But at the last two climate summits, Jan, I was just a few months ago on the Arabian Peninsula for the COP28. And the year before that, I was on the Sinai Peninsula for the COP27. It just completely out in the open, this agenda to bring all the religions of the world together behind this really pagan, pantheistic, demonic agenda that is masquerading as an effort to save the planet from human emissions of CO2. Mark Henry, did you see this coming? Jan, as I read through the New Testament, you find that they're going to end up worshiping the creation rather than the creator in Romans chapter one. So we should have anticipated this. But what is fascinating, and Alex has brought this out, and we've all interviewed and talked about this some in the past, this is the new gospel. And if you remember in Galatians chapter 1, the warning there to the church is, don't embrace another gospel. Someone comes to you preaching another gospel. In fact, they even call it another gospel. The words of like repent, the sin against nature, the sin against the world, and you need to repent of that. It's not repent, change your mind, believe in Jesus. It's repent that you're using water or other resources here on the planet. So it is another gospel. And according to Galatians chapter one, Christians should not embrace that. They need to see this as another gospel and 
let that angel or that spokesperson, quite honestly, be accursed. Here's the thing, and I think what jumped out at me, Alex, particularly in the message of yours that I listened to, I'm going to play about a 40-second clip here, because in this little clip, the person that you are interviewing, they're going to talk about heaven on earth. Now, I get it that we want clean air and clean water and clean forests, and by the way, I'm among those who want those things. I'm not one who thinks that we're going to obtain any kind of heaven on earth. All religions teach us to respect the creation that we have been given. And we've done kind of a terrible job of that. And so with a t new kind of Ten Commandments of climate change, which are an addendum to, not a replacement for, the original Ten Commandments, and a third covenant that we're some kind of working on between mankind and creation, that we would refocus on those elements of the teachings from across religions that point us in the direction of fixing the problems that we've created so that life can thrive on this planet and so that we can build that proverbial kingdom of heaven here on earth. So Alex, that was one of the founders of COP27 in Egypt a couple of years ago. Again, talking about building heaven on earth, which quite frankly is dominion theology, though I assure you this gentleman is not into any theology, correct? That's exactly right. The background before that conversation began was so fascinating, Jan. They had just done this big ceremony, this absolutely blasphemous ceremony. They had all these self-proclaimed religious leaders of the world march up to the top of Mount Sinai. And first of all, they did a climate repentance ceremony. And all I could think about in seeing this is like, this is probably something like what the prophets of Baal looked like <laughs> when confronted by Elijah. Just totally ridiculous, dancing around and repenting to the climate gods for their CO2 emissions and their airfare and their steak dinners. Really, really silly. But then it got even worse. They took out these two tablets painted green that were supposed to be the new Ten Commandments. And the individual who was responsible gave a speech really just shrieking and hollering about how governments need to do more to save us from CO2. And then he smashed these tablets on the floor. Of course, it was meant to be the redo of what Moses did when he found God's people worshiping this ridiculous golden cap. He probably didn't see the irony there in the syncretism, but that's the backdrop. They had unveiled these new Ten Commandments, and even before the ceremony took place with major religious leaders from all the major denominations, they even had some evangelicals there, by the way, or self-proclaimed evangelicals participating in this, but they had released this new Ten Commandments to the world, and the UN itself had put out a report uh, just a couple of weeks ahead of this summit arguing in very plain terminology that the systems of morality and ethics that, in their view, had evolved over thousands of years, and of course this was a direct reference to the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law, those were no longer adequate for the modern world because they weren't helping us to protect Mother Earth. And so they concluded in this report, uh, Human Development, that we needed a new system of morality and ethics that would cause people to act according to new moral codes. That's their language, not mine. So they did this blasphemous ceremony. They unveiled these new Ten Commandments. And I ran into four of the main organizers of this thing. One of them is the gentleman you just heard. His name was James Sternlich. He's the CEO of the Peace Department. And the context before I had asked him that question, I had asked him also, you know, a lot of American Christians are kind of uncomfortable with the idea of a new Ten Commandments, right? They think God gave them the original Ten Commandments. Here you're coming up with a new Ten Commandments. But then he doubled down, not only on the new Ten Commandments, yeah, UN and friends will give you a new Ten Commandments, but then he added that other part that I was not expecting, that we're going to use these new Ten Commandments to build the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Right. And all I could think of is, man, they're talking about the kingdom of the Antichrist, and it's so clear. Exactly. But in the new Ten Commandments, we must feel the pain of the earth, they say, and she's in pain due to our carbon emissions. Alex, do you think we're heading for climate lockdowns? It's a very real possibility. If they think they can get away with it, they absolutely will. And I've watched this develop. In fact, at the most recent climate summit, you had the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus. He's got a very long and illustrious yep. career in Marxism and terrorism. In fact, he was on the Politburo of the Tigray People's Liberation Front. This is an ethno-Marxist terrorist organization that operated in Ethiopia. And he came out and said, the climate crisis is a health crisis. You've got the World Bank saying we can learn lessons on how to solve the climate crisis by looking at how we dealt with the COVID crisis. So they want to apply all of those same totalitarian policies, including, by the way, the digital IDs, the tracking of everything you do. It was contact tracing. Now it'll be for your carbon footprint. They want to implement all of those under the pretext of saving us from climate change. So it's hard to overemphasize the danger 
of this totalitarian agenda, and they very much see climate change and pandemic as interchangeable when it comes to imposing these policies on humanity. So, Mark Henry, your sin is your environmental footprint. We know this is complete, utter nonsense. But having said that, a huge percentage of the world buys into this hook, line, and sinker. Absolutely, Jan. And I don't know if you picked up on that one sentence he had there. We're coming up with a third covenant. So we've got the first covenant of the law. Jesus talks about a new covenant, the promise in Jeremiah 31. In fact, when we have communion, we hold that cup. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now they come up with 10 commandments and they come up with a new covenant of reconciliation. This is so blasphemous. This is straight from the pit of hell. And there's no way of saying it even softer than that. This is from the pit of hell. And then to blasphemy towards Christ, because we're looking forward to Jesus setting up God's kingdom on earth. And they specifically say, man is going to set up a kingdom on earth in opposition to God. This sounds just like Genesis chapter 11 where they said, we're not going to do what God says. We're going to come together. We're going to build a tower unto God. We're going to be gods unto ourselves. This is fascinating time to live. But the bottom line is this. Jesus is coming, and he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and he is not happy with that sort of commentary. All of this requires global solutions like global government. Folks, you've heard me talk about global government for way over a decade here on Understanding the Times Radio because it's at the door. You are listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Florida, Alex Newman. We're going to say more about his books in a minute. And Pastor Mark Henry, pastor of Revived Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and 412 Church in San Jacinto, California. Heads up, folks, because we have an Understanding the Times night coming up Thursday, April the 11th, just outside of Minneapolis. Alex Newman is my guest. And that will be held at Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, 7 to 9 p.m. Doors open 6 p.m. That's all central time. And Mark, they can live stream it. Why don't you give us that information? They can live stream it off the Mark Henry Ministry app. Use your Roku, Apple TV, etc. Join us, get a party together, invite some friends over. We'd love to have you participate with us. And do it the simple way, folks, the way I do it, MarkHenryMinistries.com, MarkHenryMinistries.com. If you want to live stream 7 to 9 p.m., and that would be Central Time, Thursday, April the 11th, doors open 6 p.m., plenty of seating for those of you who want to come out to suburban Minneapolis. And then we will be posting it a day or so later to the usual platforms. We'll also have a DVD made for it a couple of days after that. I want to just have us move into a related topic because we just got through saying, in essence, that everything we're talking about requires global solutions like global government. And we are in a race towards a one world system. The Bible talks about that very, very heavily. And we're also going to be then in a race towards a new monetary system. And Alex talks extensively about this as well. I think what I'd like to do to introduce the next few minutes of discussion would be to play, and folks, you may have heard Pippa Malmgren on the programming before. It's a clip well worth repeating because she's basically saying that a new financial system must be the underpinning of our new world order. And basically, that's what we're talking about here for the hour, a coming new world order. What is the global religion going to be? The discussion we had on this whole climate fanaticism, etc. According to Pippa Malmgren at the World Government Summit, she's been an advisor to presidents, so is her father. Um, it's going to be the backbone of the architecture of the new world order. What underpins a world order is always the financial system. Hmm. Uh, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71. And so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. 
Yeah, what are the slaves doing? Hmm, <laughs> they'll have total transparency, right? Uh, now, we're not gonna have time to get into this today, but she actually hit on a couple of really important points that I wanna mention. The Bank for International Settlements proposed two years ago, and they're working on this right now, creating an international blockchain ledger. They propose to tokenize every single asset in the known universe, every tree, every car, every house, every toothbrush, and that token will live on this international blockchain ledger. Controlled, of course, by the Bank for International Settlements. And if you want to interact with this ledger, say you want to sell your car, you want to buy something, the only way to do it will be to use CBDCs. So you will basically be shut out of the economy completely. You will not be able to buy or sell if you won't participate with the digital system. So, Alex Newman, I have been talking about this for at least a year and a half, and I thought it would be even being implemented as we're speaking What's taking so long? Part of it is the technology. They just have not had the technology yet to implement this around the world. Now, the Bank for International Settlements proudly tells you that about 95% of all the central banks in the world are working on a central bank digital currency. But to truly roll this out around the entire world, you're going to have to have everybody connected. Everybody's going to have to have a smartphone. Every merchant, every little seller of bananas on the street corner is going to have to be able to take digital currency. And there are a lot of countries where there's just not enough prosperity to make that happen. And so they're working on this now through the World Bank, through the International Monetary Fund, through the foreign aid budgets of the United States and the European Union. They're working on bringing all of this into place. But there's so many working parts. And so I think what they're going to do, and we've already seen central bank digital currencies rolled out in several countries, including about 100 miles from me in the Bahamas, they've already rolled out their sand dollar is what they call it. But we'll see this CBDC system run in parallel with cash. And as they get closer to the goal where they know the technology is in place, they know they've got all systems firing on all cylinders, they'll start demonizing cash like you can't imagine. It's a tool for terrorists. It's a tool for sex traffickers and drug dealers and pimps. So there's still, I think, a little bit of time between now and then just because they have to get all the technology worked out. But they've told us what they want to do, a global system where every transaction will happen digitally, it will be tracked, and it will live on this international blockchain. So folks, 2,000 years ago when Revelation 13 was written, it probably sounded pretty wild, the idea that there'd be a one-world system that could prevent everybody from buying or selling if they wouldn't take the mark. What we're watching right now is the architecture of that system being built in front of our eyes. Mark Henry, your comment to all of this, please. Jan, as I think about the two things that she mentioned, abandoning traditional money and abandoning the accounting systems that we're familiar with, this is godlike. In other words, only God can have everything in the whole universe nailed down, but they're going to create through AI and with the technology that's coming before us, this like total control. It is, again, Satan just shaking his fist at God, said, I will be like the most high. And I'm just taken back that they're so bold, so forthright in their blasphemy and affirmation of it. I would be as well. Get a hold of my two guests, Alex Newman. You can find him at libertysentinel.org, libertysentinel.org. Mark Henry, you can find at markhenryministries.com, markhenryministries.com. And again, the evening would be Thursday. April the 11th at Revive Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time. Doors open 6 p.m. live stream. If you'd like to at markhenryministries.com, it will be posted to our respective websites probably a day or two later, offered as well as a DVD probably two or three days later. Upcoming in the summer is going to be Dr. Mark Hitchcock. He'll be with us on Thursday evening, June the 6th, and then Thursday, August the 1st, Michelle Bachman will be with us again. Same location, same live streaming info, never any cost. It's a first come, first serve, plenty of seats available. And again, let me just mention Alex's two books. And he's got more than that. But we carry, and we've talked about it on air, Deep State, The Invisible Government Behind the Scenes. You can find that in my online store. I did an hour on it about six months ago would be in my radio archives. You can also find it on YouTube and Rumble. And then, Alex, you have a new book, and I want you to give us a paragraph about it. It is Indoctrinating Our Children to Death, Government Schools, War on Faith, Family, and Freedom, and How to Stop It. This has only been out about a month. Folks, we do not have it. You can find it at Amazon. You can find it at libertysentinel.org. 
give us a commercial on this, Alex, and then we have questions a little bit later. Well, thank you so much, Jan. And I do believe this is one of the most important issues facing the church, facing the family, and facing our country, because what's happening right now, our children are being deliberately and systematically turned away from God, away from the truth, away from the Word of God, and toward globalism, the preparation for this one world system. And it's being done very openly. One of the things that I talk about in the book, the UN has what they call the World Core Curriculum. It was written by the man who they describe as the father of global education, Robert Mueller. And in the teacher's manual, in the foreword, he actually admits that it's based on the teachings of Alice Bailey and the Tibetan teacher, Javal Kul. Well, Alice Bailey was the founder of the Lucifer Publishing Company, and this Tibetan teacher was not a Tibetan or a teacher. In fact, Alice Bailey claimed to be communicating with spiritual entities. If you read your Bible, we're clearly talking about demons here. And these demons were giving her secret insights into the coming one world system. And she talks about them very extensively in books that I have here in my library for research purposes, like Education in the New Age. So the system of so-called education is preparing children to live under a one world antichrist system. It's doing it very openly. And we see the numbers, right? Millennials, my generation, most millennials in America today reject even the label Christian. Some of the data that's come out, something like 80 to 90 percent of Christian children who go through 12 years of this indoctrination program will leave the church and will leave the faith. So I think it's critical for Americans and for Christians, for the church to understand what's happening and also what the Bible teaches on these subjects. It is just absolutely critical. And it's hard to think of a more significant emergency than our children being indoctrinated to submit to this wickedness. And I'm coming back to that in just a moment. First, I want to throw a question here to Mark Henry, because I haven't quite left CBDCs. Central bank digital currency, folks. I'm sure you're familiar with the term. We just have not seen it implemented. As Alex said, there are some countries, for that matter, we may have some listeners, some of those countries who do have it. America does not have it yet. But as Alex said, Mark Henry, at first, cash and CBDC will run parallel. And then they'll begin to tell us well, this cash is only for terrorists. It's only for drugs. It's not healthy. It's going to make you sick. It's got germs on it. Don't you want to transition to all digital currency? Can't you see the glories of it, people? Yeah, I think that's going to be the selling point right there for your safety, for your security. So that way no one breaks in and steals all of your cash that's in your account. All of us have been hacked, Jan. I just was actually hacked my email just even today and I had to send out a note to all of our staff. So all of us know what it is to be hacked. Now imagine the threat, the warning, the oops that a bank makes and, oh, someone hacked us. And so out of fear, everyone driven to a digital currency, it's only a matter of time. Alex, do you have a timetable? And I know it would only be speculation and clearly it's up ahead in the very near future, but do you have a more practical timetable? We know there are a few very significant milestones coming up, Jan. For example, in September of this year, the UN is having an enormous and highly significant meeting in New York right around the time of the meeting of the General Assembly. They're calling it the Summit for the Future. And they're telling us what's going to happen at this summit. The Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, who prior to taking over the UN was the top leader of the Socialist International. It's the world's largest alliance of socialist and communist political parties. He's been putting out policy briefs in preparation for this summit for the future where he's calling for basically, you don't even have to read between the lines, calling for turning the United Nations into a global dictatorship. Policy brief number two, as one example, I broke this story last year, calls for giving the UN full and total authority, even over nation states, over businesses, over non-governmental organizations in the event of a global emergency. And as you read this document, you'll find out very quickly, pretty much anything could be a global emergency, a war, an economic crisis, an environmental crisis, a black swan event. And then they say it doesn't even have to be a global emergency, and it might be an emergency that we haven't thought of yet. It might be something from space. So pretty much under any pretext that the secretary general determines is a global emergency, the U.N. would assume full and total control. So that's on the agenda for later this year. They've got, of course, the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable yeah. Development Goals where they plan to bring a lot of this in by the year 2030. And Jen, if you read the Agenda 2030, it is very clearly a comprehensive roadmap for global totalitarian government. The head of the UN General Assembly regularly called it the master plan for humanity back when it was adopted. And they've been working on this three-pronged approach. Peter Drucker referred to it as the three-legged stool to bring about major global changes. 
the governments of the world. That's one leg of the stool. And of course, the United Nations represents governments, right? Virtually all governments in the world. Then you have the business community. So the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab's operation, has signed a strategic partnership with the UN to bring the global business community on board. And they've done that very well. And then the last leg, the religious leg of the stool, that is what you opened up the program with, Dr. Aza Karam. She's saying this is the UN of religions. Now, in 2019, they met in Germany and unanimously agreed all these religious leaders, uh, including the top leaders of the Vatican, Islam, Hinduism, all these different religions of the world. They claim to represent all the religions of the world. They all agreed they were going to commit to human development as set forth in the 2030 agenda. So you've got the religious, the government and the business communities all walking in lockstep toward the system. And 2030 is a very, very significant year for them. So, Mark Henry, 2030, for discussion here, we could say, well, is that the biblical tribulation? Is that the time of Jacob's trouble? We don't know. That's total speculation. But it could be. We could be talking about the kingdom of the Antichrist tomorrow, for that matter. But 2030 could certainly be a prime date. Would I be wrong? No, absolutely, Jan. But we ought to keep in mind that the return of Jesus for the church, the rapture of the church, is imminent. So that could happen any time. This could be accelerated by God. And quite honestly, Every day I get up and I can't even believe that we're here, especially at the level of blasphemy, especially at the level of rebellion of man's heart. I mean, you think back in Genesis 6 and God says, my spirit will strive with man only 120 years because the thoughts of his hearts are only evil continuously. Or again, Genesis 11, where man builds the tower, rebels against God. We're not going to be spread out like God says. We're going to come together. We're going to stand against God. We are living in those kind of days where God is going to intervene. Is it tomorrow? Is it the next day or is it 2030? All I can say is, come Lord Jesus, let it be soon. Well, we're trending towards the tribulation. I'd kind of like to have a bumper sticker made with those words on it because every day you see it more and more and more. It's quite stunning, to be honest. Anything else you want to add to this scenario, either Mark or Alex? Because my goodness, we have so many things are blossoming. They're not just on the horizon. Some of these things are here. And I just want to encourage my audience to not grow faint or weary in all the things that we're watching. And Alex, the things you watch and you document and you make videos on and you write about, I don't know how you sleep at night, brother. I really don't know how you do it. Well, I appreciate that. It's easy to comfort myself knowing that Jesus Christ is going to return and is going to stop all of this wickedness. And we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but we know it's coming. And I often tell people, look, we are not the ones who should be afraid. The evildoers are the ones who should be absolutely petrified. We know how this story ends. We know the promises God has made, and we know that God's promises are as good as done. So the ones who really ought to be terrified, the ones who ought to be trembling right now, are the evildoers who are openly in league with the Prince of Darkness, working to kill, steal, and destroy. They are going to meet their end. Satan is going to end up in the lake of fire. So it is a lot to take in. Honestly, you go to these UN summits and you can feel this evil. You can feel the spiritual darkness that is all around these things. But when you're walking with the Lord, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, when you have the Word of God and the promises that God has made to us, You know, it's easy to fall into that temptation, but when we know who our God is and what our God has done and what he is going to do, we ought to be rejoicing. We ought to be encouraged and excited, and we ought to understand, too, time is short, ladies and gentlemen. We need to treat this situation with the urgency that it deserves. There are people who are going to spend eternity in hell. We should not be worrying about our carbon emissions. We should be preaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we should be telling them what is coming. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better. Mark Henry, church times for your church services in Brooklyn Park would be Saturday. What time? 4 p.m. and then Sunday at 8 and 9.30 and 11 a.m. At 8 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. is traditional music. Fantastic. And in California? 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. And I believe you live stream Minneapolis time, correct? Correct. Say just a quick heads up, because we have another pastor's huddle June 4th, 5th, and 6th, coordinated by our own Pastor Josh Schwartz in cooperation with Mark Henry Ministries and Olive Tree Ministries. We've had two such events with pastors from across America and Canada, sitting under the teaching of Dr. Mike Powell, and these events revolve around our Understanding the Times conferences held here in suburban Minneapolis, and the next one again coming up. June 4th, 5th, and 6th, 
and that will be in conjunction with the Understanding the Times with Dr. Mark Hitchcock at that time. No charge, but travel expense is up to you, meal expense, some of that is up to you as well. Why don't you email josh at olivetreeviews.org, josh at olivetreeviews.org. Again, Dr. Mike Powell will return. Topic? The Homiletics of a Dispensational Hermeneutic, Faithfully Exegeting and Expositing the Text. Find all details at olivetreeviews.org, and then to conferences and events, and then to the pastor's huddle. I'm not quite leaving the topic here of the one world system. And what I want to do is because what it's going to necessitate, what's paving the way for this new world order, so to speak, would be the invasion of our, guess what, folks, our borders. This is a clip I want to play of Alex. It's going to introduce a short segment we're going to do on this, and then we're going to move to another topic while we still have time. Some of the top leaders of the UN have talked about this, right? Their migration czar, Peter Sutherland, uh, used to be Goldman Sachs, a big Bilderberg guy. Uh, I believe he passed away now, but his name was Peter Sutherland. And uh, here's what he said. This was posted on the UN's website, folks, an interview with Peter Sutherland. He said, I will ask governments to cooperate and recognize that sovereignty is an illusion. Sovereignty is an absolute illusion that has to be put behind us. The days of hiding behind borders and fences are long gone. We have to work together and cooperate together to make a better world. That means taking on some of the old shibboleths, taking on some of the old historic memories and images of our own country and recognizing that we're part of humankind. Do you see what he's saying, folks? We have to get rid of this old vision of our country and forget, you know, forget, forget national sovereignty. Right? That's an old shibboleth. Uh, we need to now recognize that we're part of a one world system, right? A one world economic, political and uh, religious system. That's what they're working toward, folks. And uh, it was amazing that Peter Sutherland kind of openly admitted this. And so that's a big part of this, folks. They want to eliminate the last barrier to um, globalism, which is the nation state. And so we see this, right? We see this happening all over Europe. You see in in Frankfurt, Germans are are the minority. In London, you got Brits are in the minority. They have a Muslim mayor now and a pagan prime minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, In Brussels, Belgians are a tiny minority now. Uh, In Malmo and Sweden, Swedes are a tiny minority. So this is happening deliberately, folks. And, And very soon, within a generation or two, a lot of the people in these countries are actually going to be the minority in their own country. right? If, if current trends continue or accelerate, these people will be a minority in their own country. And at that point, you wake up and say, huh, well, why, why even have a country? Right. These, these people who live here, they don't speak the same language as me. They don't have the same values as me. They're, I mean, they're totally different. They, they don't you know, have anything in common with me. Why do we have this arbitrary set of lines on the map called a country? Right. Let's just be a EU or let's just be a one world system. If you just joined me, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell. I have on the line Mark Henry, and I have our guest for the evening of April the 11th, Understanding the Times, Spring 2024, Alex Newman. Find more information at libertysentinel.org. Find more information about my co-host for the evening, Mark Henry at markhenryministries.com. Gentlemen, immigration, an engineered crisis as a part of helping us rush to the one world system. Alex, help us understand. Yeah, this is such an important part of the agenda for a one world system, the mass migration. Now, the World Economic Forum predicted some years ago that by 2030, we would see a billion people coming to the United States, Canada, Western Europe. As soon as they can crack Japan and South Korea, they'll be flooding those places as well. And I think nobody explained it as well to me as the Secretary of State of Hungary. I was in Hungary and Budapest some years ago, and I had an opportunity to interview the Secretary of State there, Zoltan Kovacs. And he explained to me that the reason they're doing this is because they want to undermine the nation state and they want to undermine Christianity. If you notice, the nations that are being overrun with migrants are primarily what used to be known as Christendom or the free world. So this is being strategically engineered. And of course, I say this as somebody who's married to an immigrant. I'm not against immigration. But what we're seeing here is not, quote unquote, immigration. What we're seeing is a weaponized mass flow of people being directed at the United States, being imported with the help of the United States government. And the same thing's happening in Europe for a very strategic purpose. Now, a lot of people and I've interviewed the former head of ICE, the former head of Customs and Border Protection, and they both told me they think that the Democrats just want to import more Democrats. There may be some truth to that, but I think the much broader issue is This is an effort to undermine the nation state and the historic Christianity of the nations that were once Christian. And when you understand it in that context, it suddenly makes perfect sense. 
Mark Henry, your take on this? As I watch it unfolding, Jan, a couple of things. Number one is you stop teaching history to the kids. You start tearing down all of the monuments of the United States that made the United States special and unique. You start reading the book of Acts and Acts 17 and the sermon at Mars Hill, and the Apostle Paul describes how it's God who sets the boundaries for nations. And you see how Satan wants to control the world. And so, again, the Antichrist being the type of Jesus is setting up a global world system to oppose the Lord Jesus Christ, to mimic that. This has to happen. It's just amazing to watch it unfold, and it's a heartbreak to see. And Alex, one of the things that you just said is how people are going to wake up one day and it's like, why die for this nation? Why support this nation? We're already seeing that in the recruiting numbers across the United States, whether you're talking the Marine Corps or the Navy or the Army. We're having a hard time having a standing army anymore. It's a direct result of this attack on America and America's sovereignty, the uniqueness of America. Any other thoughts on this topic before we move on? I mean, my goodness, Mark and I, we're part of what's becoming a state being called Minnesota Stan as far as immigration goes. And we've got some, well, I call it the land of 10,000 lakes, and sometimes it's the land of 10,000 terrorists. It can be a very frightening ordeal, but it is a crisis engineered. It absolutely is. And I had a front row seat to this before moving back to the United States. I've been overseas almost all my life, mostly Latin America, Africa, and Europe. But most recently, I was in Sweden. And so I had a front row seat to watch this. And I include two chapters in the Deep State book that you have through Olive Tree Ministries on this very subject. And so they're bringing in huge numbers of Muslims. Actually, the Swedish government was flying airplanes down into the Middle East and picking people up and bringing them in. And almost right away, they started saying, well, hey, we can't celebrate Christmas. We can't have Christmas markets. The lesbian bishop of the Apostate Church of Sweden actually said we should take the crosses down from our Mm -hmm. churches to avoid offending the newcomers. So this is an agenda to de-Christianize the nations that historically God has used to spread the gospel all over the world. Sweden and the United States were two of the largest missionary sending countries on the planet in human history. Today, they're being called post-Christian nations. You might even start calling them soon anti-Christian nations. And part of this is native domestic factors, but a big part of this too is the massive immigration that they have engineered and encouraged. And we do carry Alex's book, Deep State, The Invisible Government Behind the Scenes in my online store, in my office a call. And we carry Mark Henry's book, The Man Code, that would be in my online store. You can also call my office. Mark Henry, give us a paragraph on The Man Code. Jan, 12 essential things every man needs to know As we've seen the family tore apart, we've seen men attacked. Again, we're seeing it in the whole recruiting numbers and how men are vilified. We have found these 12 essential things in the scriptures to just be absolute the gold standard that we need to be calling young men to. And we're seeing guys rise up and so many are blessed. We're just really encouraged how God's using the book. Alex has a new book, and I want to ask a few questions based on his newest book. We do not have it in our store, folks, but you can find it on Amazon. You can find it at libertysentinel.org, Indoctrinating Our Children to Death, Government Schools, War on Faith, Family and Freedom, and How to Stop It. And I've tried to come up with a few questions, Alex, my inability to get through the book only because of a time issue, because I know the subject itself is extremely crucial. And here's a question for you. I thought America was founded as a Christian nation, and what has happened in the public school system is absolutely shocking. How did it become so spiritually toxic? And is this setting them up and America for the beast system of the last days? It clearly has to be. I'll start with the second question. It absolutely is. And I think that's really the key takeaway. The system that we have now is preparing children to submit voluntarily and willingly to the Antichrist and this diabolical system that is being built right in front of our eyes. And the history is actually fascinating. If you look at the earliest education we had in this country, the Bible was not only the primary textbook, in many cases, it was the only textbook. You look back at the Pilgrims, for example, in the 1640s, long before we had the United States of America, they passed the Old Deluder Satan Act. And the premise of the law, as they explained in this law, was that that old deluder Satan wants to keep men ignorant of the scriptures so that they can be deceived. And for that purpose, they said, we have to make sure everybody in this colony can read and write. And so that was entrusted to parents with support from the church as well, if necessary. The current system that we have really has its roots in the early 1800s. An individual by the name of Robert Owen, who was a communist who rejected Christianity, wanted to get rid of private property, wanted to get rid of the family, publicly advocated for the government to start educating children. 
This was a totally alien concept throughout Christendom and really throughout the world. Nobody had seriously proposed government education of children since Plato. And he ended up setting up a movement to try to bring this about. And one of the individuals who was involved, Orestes Brownson, eventually defected and blew the whistle on what they were doing. He said the great object was to get rid of Christianity. So that was the very genesis of this system. You fast forward, that system took root in Prussia. It was reimported to the United States by another God-hating individual, Horace Mann. And then John Dewey teamed up with John Rockefeller to weaponize the system further. And John Dewey was actually a very religious man. He was a big fan of the Soviet Union. And he and about 30 of his friends got together and they did what they thought was inventing, founding a new religion called humanism. And they wrote in the Humanist Manifesto, this is almost word for word, the first tenet of their manifesto, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. And as you read it, it's a lot of communism, get rid of the profit motive, etc. But the fundamental premise is that man can be his own God. We can determine for ourselves what's right and wrong. So they thought that was clever. They thought that was a new religion. Of course, if you go back to Genesis chapter three, we've heard that lie before, right? It's the oldest lie mm-hmm. in the book. <laughs> Satan is so mm-hmm. uncreative. Ye shall be as gods. Right. And then in the early 1960s, Jen, this was really the turning point where they finally severed the last connections in education and Christianity. This was the Supreme Court rulings where the Supreme Court said we couldn't have prayer and we couldn't have Bible. The justice who wrote the dissent in that case, Justice Potter Stewart, hit the nail on the head. He said what happened here was the establishment of a religion of secularism. Mm. In other words, what the government was prohibited from doing under the First Amendment, they did. They established a false religion from the pit of hell. They forced us to pay for its propagation with our taxes. And worse, they forced us to hand over our children to be brainwashed with this. And so a few generations of that, we should not be surprised to see the fruit all around us, families falling apart, children committing suicide. They don't know what bathroom to go in. It's the logical end result of indoctrinating them with a false religion like John Dewey's. Mark, your thoughts? Jan, I've grieved like all of us have as we've seen schools continue to reinforce that the state has control over our children rather than parents and encouraging the students to call the authorities against their parents. And it is such a heartbreak. But the reality is this, is that Satan is using now the school systems to oppose the people of God, oppose Christianity, oppose everything that's good. And we see it in our society. We see it in the school board meetings that I've sat in right in our hometown there in Brooklyn Park. It's absolutely a heartbreak. But this is the hand of Satan to destroy, again, families and the institutions that God has created. Well, we've got drag queens reading to elementary school kids now, Mark. Absolutely. And by the way, the book is excellent, Alex. That chapter on sex ed is a must read because parents are frustrated when we go to these school board meetings and we bring up the explicit, godless immorality being thrust upon our children. But Alex, you really help us do understand the historical root of that. You help us understand the premise by which this godless society is now using that. And Jan, I was thinking about that today. It says in the last days in Second Peter 3, that there will be mocking the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says the motivation for that is that they were following after their own lusts. And so immorality is part of the base that motivates people to mock the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the last days. And that's what we're seeing. So what do you gentlemen then recommend? And I'm keeping this question in the context of, again, the thought of indoctrinating our children to death. Alex, what do you recommend parents and grandparents do? Not everyone can homeschool. I think this is, again, one of the most important issues facing all Christians, the church itself, and of course our country. And I think the simple answer is we need to go back to the Bible. We need to go back to what God has revealed to us in his word about parenting, about discipleship, about the role of families. And you're right. Obviously, not everybody can homeschool. I do believe it's the gold standard, but I believe at a very minimum, God expects us to ensure that our children are getting a proper education that is God-centered, that is God-honoring, that relies on the Word of God as the primary source of truth. And the Scriptures are filled with this. I mean, you can go back to the Old Testament. If you go to Deuteronomy, God commands His people so clearly in Deuteronomy 6 and in Deuteronomy 11 to teach their children diligently when they're walking by the way, when they're sitting in their house, when they're laying down to go to sleep, when they're waking up in the morning. We should be diligently making disciples of our children. Obviously, Christian education won't save your children. Jesus Christ saves your children. 
but God has put an enormous responsibility on us. If you go to Ephesians 6, 4, we're commanded to bring up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We know from Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is what it says in Proverbs 9, 10. We know in Proverbs 1, 7, God tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. How on earth can we subject our children to an education where not only is the fear of the Lord not being instilled in them, the Lord is being mocked and yes. ridiculed. Yes. They're not going to get any knowledge or wisdom there. So we need to go back to the Word of God. That should be our guide for educating and discipling our children. Not everybody can homeschool, but there are very good options, even for those who can't. Again, Alex is our guest, Understanding the Times, Thursday, April the 11th, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time. That would be at Revive Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Come on out. No cost, no reservation, plenty of seating. And you can live stream that central time at markhenryministries.com. Markhenryministries.com. We'll have it up on our various platforms a day later. We'll have it in DVD form probably two or three days later. Mark, you want to make any more comment here about the indoctrinating our children to death topic? We need to wrap things up and put a little bit more hopeful spin on things as well. Jan, I would just say in the indoctrination of our children, we could dismiss this as insignificant. Maybe I don't have little kids anymore, but remember this, that in 1932, the Hitler youth were being indoctrinated. Yeah. And by 1940, they were the SS troops that were slaughtering Jews. And that's how this works. And Satan will prey upon the little ones, the lambs. And yeah. that's why we've got to assume the responsibility. And so parents, I would just say to them, I would beg you, Keep the important things, the important things. Alex in his book, he says, and rightly so, don't follow the educational pagan system. Don't try and mimic that. Jared and I purposed long ago, our kids, we were going to focus on the gospel, character development. That's what the man code is all about, the 12 essential things. And we're going to teach them the three R's, just like the founding fathers received. And I'm going to tell you, all three of my kids are doing fantastic. They're great citizens. They're great moms and dads. They're great servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're great citizens of the United States. They're great patriots. And you can go back. You can do it, too. If Jerry and I can, you can, too. Mark, we need a little bit of a pastoral roundup here of the hour because we have presented, whenever we talk about the kingdom of the Antichrist being formed, that's obviously a very sobering topic. It's also reality, so we just have to look at square in the eye. But at the same time, the Bible is filled with promises to believers for the last days, as well as the warnings for the last days. Well, the only way to keep from losing our minds, Jan, as we look at these things, hear all these things, see them unfolding before our eyes, is go back to the great and precious promises of God. And one of the things that stands out to me that helps me cope with these things is Psalm 73. That psalm describes how the psalmist saw how the wicked are constantly prospering, how they seem to get away with murder. Everything seems to go the right way for them and the wrong way for us. But in verse 17, in kind of a moment of despair, the psalmist goes to the sanctuary, and it says that he realizes that God has put them in slippery places. And all of these people that have raised up their hands, raised up all of their resources, all of the things that they have against God, God has put them in a slippery place. In a moment, they're going to fall, and God will be honored. God will not be mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he reap. Jesus is coming. Do not lose heart. The wicked are put in slippery places. Jesus is coming. Alex, you want to wrap up our hour with a couple of minutes? It's all yours. Well, I appreciate it so much, Jan. And I love that our brother just went to the Psalms. I'd like to go to Psalm 2, which is just for me so encouraging. Amen. It's such a perfect psalm for the times that we live in. Starting in verse 2, the Bible reads, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And then God's response to this, I think, should really just encourage all believers. Starting in verse 4, it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And then in verse 5, it says, He shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Continuing into verse 6, it says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And here's the real kicker, verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So folks, just like Brother Mark just explained, yeah, it looks like the wicked are prospering. Yeah, it looks like they have all the money and the control and the power and the honor. But God is going to deal with them, and we should 
understand that this is a very urgent time. We have a mission from God. We're to go out and make disciples. We're to preach the good news, knowing full well that our King is coming for us. And you don't want to be on the wrong side of that when the time comes. Amen to that. Again, LibertySentinel.org, a lot more info on Alex Newman. You could come out and meet him on Thursday, April the 11th in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, suburb of Minneapolis. You can tune in live, MarkHenryMinistries.com. You can catch it a day or two a week, a month later at our various platforms where we post these programs, including my website, OliveTreeViews.org. Thursday, April the 11th at 7 p.m. Central Time. I want to go out of the program with just a paragraph because every time we talk about a coming global system, I am reminded of the ultimate in global systems, the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth. When the government shall be upon his shoulders, 1,000 years of Christ ruling and reigning, when the kings of the earth will be in serious retirement, because you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, along with the King of Kings, will be in charge. I can't wait. I say, please bring it on. And I want to thank you for listening. And we will talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Dot org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. No one said it would be easy to be born for such a time as this, but we are here on assignment. God has everything under control as he orchestrates the final few acts of the church age and as he causes all things to fall into place. <laughs>